You're listening to Earnestly Speaking, the only weekly podcast that covers friends, foes, and anything that goes. And now, for your badass host, Ernest Owens. Hello, everyone. (laughs) My name is Ernest Owens, and you're listening to Earnestly Speaking. This is the first time I've ever done a podcast by myself. I have done guest appearances, I have done co-hosting experiences, but this is like the first real damn time I've actually done a podcast by myself. And it's wow because so many people have been asking me to do this for a long time. And I just never had the, the you know, the, it's not confidence. I got a lot of confidence. I'm cocky as hell. I think what it is is that I just did not feel that I could be able to really invest the time and energy into it. And, you know, also, too, I'm a perfectionist. So there's things that I want to see get done. I want to see, you know, money. I need to see the grants. I need to see funding for it because it's expensive to get this off the road. I mean, I got all this. I'm on the Hyo 240 PR mic with the windbreaker whatever they call this the other book boof booster i had you know really great friends who told me all about it. i got the new macbook pro with the 16 inch um the best like what's it Sonsenheim? i can't pronounce the headphones i got a, a pre sonus audio box uh i got all the equipment all the state of art equipment i was a, i'm a professional if i'm gonna do a podcast it's gotta be high quality so you know i really you know got some good um resources and funding to really put this together to give you all something that you all have wanted. And so for this episode, you know, it's more of a sneak peek. It's more of an intro. It's more of a good housekeeping. I I just want to give you all all of the, the tea and some shade before we get into like the actual season. And so this is my like sneak peek episode and also the episode that for people who, you know, get lost in the sauce or come back to the show and they want to know who the hell am I and what I'm about. I always will refer people to this episode because this is the episode where I'm going to pour out all of who I am and what I'm about so that when I kick into the seasons coming up and episodes and everything else, you don't have to be like, huh, what, huh, what, you know. So I, I thought this would be a great way to do this um, as we get into this exciting new podcast. So let me just go into some of the background. Like the inspiration for this show, um, earnestly speaking, and for many people who've heard this phrase, is that it is something that I've done in various iterations. So in 2010, which is now over a decade ago, my goodness, I'm getting old, (laughs) I had a radio show um, on WQHS Radio when I was uh, undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania, which I got my degree in communications. Um, this show was called Earnestly Speaking. It was a radio show that I did weekly every Saturday night from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. And I used to have some of my closest friends and um, folks from the campus. And I would go and talk about, you know, the news of the, of the week, some personal stuff. And, you know, we would just have all types of fun, sassy, shady uh, debauchery. And on that show, I had some cool special guests like John Legend, um, Elizabeth Banks, um, Mayor Nutter I had once, when the former mayor, um, Philadelphia Mayor uh, Michael Nutter. I had a couple of cool people that would pop on through. Um, and it was a great show, and I did it for nine consecutive seasons. Like I was devoted, y'all. This was um, four years of this. And it really opened up my passion for journalism. Like today I'm now an award-winning journalist. I'm the CEO of my company, Ernest Me Empire LLC. And this was like my introduction into journalism. It was like the first club I joined on student campus, um, campus life before I did student government. Like it was like within three weeks of joining, you know, and being a student at Penn, a freshman, this was my uh, first like major hobby. And I fell in love with it and it, it opened me up to writing which I'm now more known for. Um, and I did this and it was great. So once I graduated from college, I came back to doing another iteration of Earnestly Speaking. And it was a TV show on Philly Cam, which is Philadelphia Community Access Media, the local access channel in Philadelphia. And it was called, um, it was called Earnestly Speaking and it was a TV show. And so I took the elements of what I did with this show and turned it into 
a episode, like a series, like two seasons where I basically did TV things and translated it, took, took my radio voice and ideas and turned into a talk show format. And those episodes are still available on my YouTube channel. So if you put in Ernest Speaking, you put in my name, Ernest Stone, on YouTube, you can watch the TV version of what I, I did with this concept. It was great. Um, I did two seasons of it. I have about like maybe 18 to 20 episodes that I did and I got busy. I, I kind of blew up. I had some moments and this was uh, about five years ago when I first did this show. Um, and then I just, you know, got busy and started writing and life happens and everything else happens. And I um, put away my earnestly speaking cap again. And then podcasts started to really take off. And I started to see a lot of people I, I knew and, and liked. And uh, many of my friends and, and folks uh, brought me on to podcasts. I was on NPR. I was on a couple other great shows. And I started to really fall in love with it again. And every time I would make an appearance on some of these podcasts, people would tell me, you know, you should do this. Like, you know, why don't you have a podcast? Why don't you have a podcast? And, and I would just like, you know, I don't, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I don't have the time. I would make excuses. And the more and more I got into um, looking it up and, and figuring out what was good and what was going to work for me, the better uh, it, it got. And, um, you know, I just kept on thinking about it and figured out what I want to do. And then, you know, here we are, a new year, uh, new opportunities, and we're in a different time. And there's so much that needs to be said that I still feel like is not being said on these podcasts. And I said, this is the void I want to fill with it. So I decided to come back this time as a podcast. And that was what was a leading inspiration behind um, what you all are listening to now. So one of the things that's been very important, very important to me um, doing this is that I was it was very important for me to really, um, you know, look at the background of the show and, and talk about who I am and also, you know, bring one of my best friends who was a part of my radio show, Earnestly Speaking, when it was at WQHS, um, my best friend, Jamarcus Henderson, who is also going to be my best man, which we'll talk about all of that, too. So I guess I'll start back with who am I? What's my background? What's my T? So I am a Libra because I know people care about Zodiacs. And I don't really know what this, I don't know what the moon rising stuff is. I don't, I don't really know all that. What my moon rising is. Listen, I was born, if, if you know what those risings are, I want to look it up for me. I was born October 12th, 1991 in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I grew up, um, I was the oldest of four boys. Um, I have a brother that is 10 months apart from me. I have a brother that is 17. And I have a brother that's 10. And so it's a it's a wide range uh, with, 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 with us. And, you know, I was born in Chicago, moved to Houston, Texas at a young age uh, with my younger brother. My mother had a divorce and she moved to Houston and, you know, started up her life, worked for a cell phone company that became Verizon Wireless. Uh, grew up, you know, um, in, on the southwest side of Houston. Um, where I live was called the SWAT, Southwest Ailey, Texas, um, West, as they would say in Houston. And I lived right next to West Oaks Mall, um, grew up in apartments and townhomes, went to public school my entire life in the Ailey um, Independent School District. And my high school I went to was Ailey Elsick High School, which was a big ass high school, a <laughs> uh, big, like I want to say like right, maybe... 5,000 kids in my high school total. Um, my graduating class was close to 1,000. I was the class president, the valedictorian, the overachiever, got accepted to a, a, a couple of Ivies, did everything on campus. I did theater arts. I did model United Nations. I, I was just like that overachiever type. Um, but I also had my own secrets in this to my, um, you know, very poster child, goody two shoes persona. Um, I was gay. Um, I wasn't out to my family, but I was interesting enough out in high school. So I was, was definitely out in high school, you know, and people, my, my, my teachers, um, folks that I went to school with knew my family did not know. I mean, they, they probably sensed it, but I never like outwardly, you know, said it. But I mean, when you're doing Chicago musicals and enough razzle dazzle, it, 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 it will eventually, you know, get there. But 
as far as I know, I was not out, and you know, I still thought I I kept a certain type of um, you know cover. I guess you know, I always make a joke about what my straight voice is, and my best friend's laughing at me right now. And I, I, the voice I would do, I would do, I was like, "Hello, you. How y'all doing tonight? You know, my name is um, Ernest, and it's a, it's a light evening, and um, you know, I'm just trying to." See what's good with y'all tonight, you know what I mean? I'm joking. But that was what I would think of my persona, what I thought I was giving versus what was actually happening. What was actually happening was this, but a little bit of a lighter pitch. <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> Okay. So we 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 was trying to figure out, you know, well, I was, you know, navigating that, but I knew I I knew myself, and I wrote a piece about this in Death for Philadelphia magazine called Three Outs, which really talks a lot about this experience. Like I came out three times. I came out to myself, I came out to like my friends around me, and then I eventually came out to my family. So when I went to the University of Pennsylvania, which you know many people know me in that experience, and if you, I wrote another great long form piece that won a great awards. Um, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. Once I graduated, once I graduated from A. Leaf Elsick High School, you know, got all of my, you know, rah, rah, rah. I came to Philadelphia thinking I was going to be a lawyer that would eventually become a politician. And a lot of that was based on, you got to remember what time I was in. I was in a time where we had, you know, presidents that actually were dignified and exciting, you know. Now we got presidents that's just like, man, let's just get this over with. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Obama was the first black president. Obama was elected in 2008. I couldn't vote for him the first term because I was 17, so I missed it. But I remember what that was, when I, what it felt like when I saw him and, and, you know, First Lady Michelle Obama, forever First Lady Michelle Obama and, and his beautiful daughters up there. And he's giving that speech. And I remember my mom saying, you know, in the living room, and I remember my stepdad was there. And she said that day, she said, you know, you all can't, you can't blame the man now. And, you know, I mean, now I'm like critical race theory. We're going to always blame the man. But at that time, I was excited about the idea of like, you know, like that this is aspirational. Like this was, you know, my awakening saying, look, I could, I could be the president of the United States. And I know what that felt like, you know, as a, as a young black man who was definitely an overachiever and somebody was just trying to do something different and, I, I resonated a lot with um, with Obama at that time. I mean, he just was an inspiration of hope, and I read his book, lessons you know, you know, lessons from my father, and all of this 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 great stuff. And you know, I I mean, he was just you know, times have changed. You know, some of y'all, you know, I've definitely have been critical of Obama nowadays. And my first op ed for the New York Times was about how Obama just doesn't understand millennials, which is weird because we were the ones who got him elected, but that's neither here nor there. But I, I was very much so, uh, you know, looked up to him and, and wanted to follow in those type of footsteps. And then he was from Chicago. So everything was just working like Ivy League too. I was just like, I had goals, y'all. So I, you know, set off to go to Penn, which let me just say this because it's this a little petty moment, but can you all abolish the term U Penn. No one from Penn says U Penn. It is Penn or the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, Petty ran over. But I just wanted to say that everybody always say, "Oh, you went to U Penn." No, honey, it's Penn. And everybody keeps talking about Penn State. We were here first. The University of Pennsylvania was the first university. Harvard was the first college, but we was the first university. Okay, I just wanted to make that clear. Anyway, so you know, I, I set off to Penn. Notice I did not use the word U before it. But set off to Penn to really pursue um, this interest in politics. I run for student government. I run for class president. I lose my class president race. It was petty. It was messy. It was ratchet. Ran a second time. Ran a second shot. Didn't get it. But ran for student government representative at the time and got it. And I was one of the few black students on Penn's campus at the time that was a student government representative. Because that required you to get like a campus-wide vote. And one thing about Penn's campus was that it was very segregated, which it kind of still is, where they isolated you. You know, you were either a black student leader or queer student leader, a, 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 a dog loving student leader. It was like they always wanted to put you in different categories. And I just I just was a student leader. I just, you know, I had so many identities experiences that I just really didn't want to be put in one box. And so, um, you know, my time at Penn was quite interesting because I was navigating the interesting aspects of race. I was navigating um, getting this opportunity to have this queer 
explosion. Like I got to go to the neighborhood. I got to, you know, experience all of these different, um, how do I put it? I mean, I guess I was 18 when I first came to Penn. So I, I always feel like sometimes I was missing out when I was in high school, but I really wasn't because I had no business. Was out. Listen, mm, that's another conversation for another day. I wouldn't say I was missing too much out in high school, but I definitely couldn't go to clubs back then. Clearly, I wasn't doing all of that. I was, I was pretty, um, I was pretty good back then. But I would say that once I got to Philadelphia, you know, the first weekend out, I went to the neighborhood. There was college night, you know, Wednesday nights at Woody's, you know, 18 and up. So I got to go in there. I was twerking. I was dancing. I was in love with American Apparel. I used to fit those shorts. I don't know what happened. Um, and I was able to do tanks. And, you know, we was wilding. Like, we was wilding. We was having a good time. That was... Those were the days, the bad EDM music. This was the 2010s, honey. We're in a new decade now. But in the 2010s, you know, that was Rihanna with the Loud Era. Okay, only boy in the world. That whole album, s and I was a Britney fan, still a Britney fan. I was all the phases of Britney fan, okay? I was the early 90s Britney fan. I was the 2000s. Britney had some moments. Rocky era Britney. I was circus comeback Britney. I was... Okay, back on the prime, but fading Britney. I was all types of Britney stands. I just want to be clear that I was a very big Britney stan. And I was very much so into Rihanna and everything like that. Now, Beyonce, you know, I, I, I've have, I have an in and out relationship with Beyonce. I think Beyonce and I are in a good stage now. Beyonce also went to my high school, too. She went to Elite Elsick High School, according to Wikipedia. Not that I'm into sort of cited sources, but I'm just saying apparently she went to Elsick. But then she um, left, and I think she went to HSPVA, and then she started that group called Destiny's Child, and then she finally got a real career solo, and then the rest is history. But anyway, and Lizzo also went to Elsick too. A lot of talent came out of Elsick High School. People try to, you know, it's it's a it's a rival. If you're from the Southwest Side, you know they try to compare us with Hastings, Taylor, Child, Elsick, A Leaf Elsick High School. I just I just love my high school. I was their class president. They, they let me, in my outness, I was out when I ran for class president. And I want to be very clear about that. I was out and I was proud um, in high school um, with my student body. And I, and I was grateful to have good friends and people that knew me very well. My best friend, Jamarcus, went to Jack Yates. And their basketball team has talent. Um, and he has talent. And the rest of the school, I don't know much about. But I would just say... <laughs> But I would just say that, um, you know, like I said, I had a really great ex experience um, navigating myself in Philadelphia. And part of the reason why I picked Penn was because it was an Ivy League school, but Penn was known as a social Ivy to a default, right? It was social for white people. But black folks, we had, we had an okay social time, too, sometimes when, when they wasn't cutting up. But I had a, I, I had a really great opportunity to um, just, like, you know, make mistakes and learn and really figure out who I wanted to be and why. And so it did, you know, college changed me in the way that when I first came there, I was very much, I just, I was having, I wouldn't call it Lindsay Lohan. I was not doing drugs. That was not my life. But I just, you know, got a chance to really go out and meet people and, you know, not feel like I had to be on um, like I did when I was in high school. And I've juggled with myself to figure out, like, was that good for me or bad for me, how I, how I grew up in a sense. But I think that as a black man, as a black queer youth, at the time, I'm very grateful that I kind of did, you know, keep it keep it on and, and keep it keep it classy, I guess, um, when I was in high school, that I was focused on my academics in school because that's what I need to do to protect myself. I think some of the aspects and experiences of, of my upbringing um, from my environment and everything else, there was a lot of like lures, right? There was, there was drugs, there was gangs, there was all these things. And a lot of that was institutional systemic, right? We also was in a public school where there was divisions. You know, they did not necessarily, the public school education in this country is not equitable. And what my success was, was pretty much a part of a system that cherry picked those to succeed everybody didn't get the same level of attention and and i also think that just the way they fund public schools and even schools in black communities that it is a, a situation where you know there's somebody could take a chance on you but it, it's not for everybody and so i've definitely got over that exceptional magical negro um energy that oftentimes we still see people 
half like Meek Mill, good lord. But anywho, I just think that there's a lot of people who still buy into that. But I think when I went to college, I got exposed to a lot of um, theories and information that decolonized my mind and, and it woke me up, you know, critical race theory, intersectionality. Um, Dr. Kimberly, Kimberly Crenshaw is incredible. I'm great to say that I met her um, years ago and, and, and just her research and how she thinks about the world and the research that she's put out in the world, like it's incomparable. And I'm, I just, in my years in college, you know, those were the experiences that helped me understand my identity, understand the world around me, understand things that didn't make sense when I was growing up, but I didn't have the words to say. And it was in that time where a lot of my ideas about my experience at Penn changed, right? I was at a school where there was a lot of rich people. I was at a school where there was a lot of rich people that was black and white and Asian and, you know, everything in between. And as someone who came from a working class background, as somebody who, you know, is one of those first generation college students and, and, and whatnot, this was a very different experience for me. Um, and, and that understanding that changed my mind about what I wanted to do. And that's when I began to really fall in love with communication, which essentially was journalism and telling stories and sharing perspectives that reflected people that looked like me, that didn't have those platforms to share their thoughts and tell their stories. And that was something that, um, you know, politicians do their own thing. But one thing about journalism that I love to this day is that I'm able to do a lot of things. I can, you know, uh, do a podcast and, and voice my opinions out loud. I can write. I can be on TV and make television appearances sometimes. I can do a variety of things that can influence public policies and make impact and also be myself. Because I never really, you know, when I was growing up, thought that I could be myself and do the work that I do. I always thought there was always has to be a double light. There was always going to have to be a shield. There was always going to have to be a facade and that that's what you had to do, especially as a black person, especially as a black queer person, especially as a black queer person in the time in which I was coming growing up. Because remember, in early 2010 and 2008, 2009, at that time, gay marriage was not legal. There wasn't these major LGBTQ protections. People were not asking people what their pronouns were. People were not, you know, you know, really, you know, treating being LGBTQ per se as an advantage um, when you apply to college or, or, or applied for um, some type of diversity, inclusion, placement, whatever the case is. That wasn't valued at that time. And, and when you're Black, specifically trying to... Um, identify in both of these spaces, you, you get different reactions. And, and it's still a real thing. It's, it's still a real issue. It's, you know, until we have, and this is my like policy rant for the, for the episode, but until we have the Equality Act, which would protect people based on their sexual orientation, and gender expression, just like we do, or we try to do for race and gender and class and everything else, then we will finally achieve, I think, the type of real normalcy that is needed on a federal level to protect LGBTQI people from all backgrounds. And we don't have that right now. We're just piecemeal by piecemeal, city by city, municipality by municipality, trying to get this. And to me, until that federal change is instituted, then we can move forward as a society. But that, you know, that, you know, what do I know? So I had some great experiences in college when it came to exploring my passion for journalism and having a voice, one of the memorable moments of my entire life and what really reminded me that I really wanted to do journalism and, and be in this space was a contest that happened in 2012 where at the time I was 21, I had just turned 21 in October of 2012, but November it was um, Ariana Huffington from the Huffington Post at the time she was coming to Penn. It was supposed to be a connaissance speaking event. So this was basically, Penn would get these very big name um, personalities and public figures to come and give a lecture or give a speech 
um, before the undergraduates and graduate students. And Ariana Huffington was their, their person. And I was super like, wow. She's a big media person. I love, I'm loving media. I declare my major communication at Annenberg School of Communications, which is the top communication school in the world um, for undergraduates and uh, doctoral programs that I have a master's program. I end up getting my master's program later at USC in communication management, which is the top program for that particular field. So, you know, I'm a little overachiever still. But at the time when I... Um, met Ariana Huffington, it was because of an essay contest that she put out. And basically the contest was like in 500 words, write how the media matters or how it, why it's important or something like that. And I was in one of my statistic classes at the time and I had freestyled it on the, you know, they wrote it, didn't even really edit it and just said, let me take a shot and send it. I didn't think I was going to get picked actually. I was very much like, I've seen enough white mediocrity at Penn when just like in real society, like when Adele won over Beyonce for Lemonade, um, you know, a lot of, you know, people who don't deserve to win, but win because of various circumstances that has nothing to do with talent and integrity. I've had those experiences. And so I really thought that I was going to get Lemonade before Lemonade came out. I was like, I'm not going to win this contest and I don't think I'm going to get it. But, you know, for the sake of letting people know that I shot my shot, because too often, especially with black people, we're always told, well, if you just would have gave yourself a shot, you would have never would have happened. And it's like, we know what's going to happen. Like when Beyonce finished her performance and she got that R&B contemporary album for Lemonade and she got there and she was very emotional and teary-eyed and she read off that golden envelope, she knew she wasn't going out when you that night. She knew that that was her televised appearance. That was going to be the last time that night she was going to get on that Grammy stage and she was going to say an accepted speech. And I think the way that she spoke and the way that she sounded, she knew. I believe that she knew that what, what was going to happen that night. And so, you know, those moments happen. And so I was very cynical, but sometimes things are different. I got a phone call from the coordinator that said I won the contest and that I had to show up that night. I ran to my barber, who is this hilarious man named um, Saran Cassell, who is the owner, the co-owner of First Decisions Barbershop in West Philadelphia, which is my only decision, First Decisions. I've been getting my hair cut there for 10 years. Haven't looked back. All my iconic fades. He's done Mohawks. I told you I was a wild child. Frohawks. Um, what else have I done? Pompadours. Miguel. Remember Miguel did the pompadour and I did the pompadour because Miguel did. <laughs> my best friend is laughing at me. So I, I, I did pompadours. I did everything. But anyway, he has done everything. He has worked with me through all of my hair up and downs, stuff that I would like, why in the hell did I do that? But he just took my money and did it anyway. Capitalist. <laughs> but, you know, so I had to run down to get my cut because I was like, oh my goodness. And so I was like, look, I know that I didn't make an appointment. Can you fill me in? I'm meeting Ariana Huffington. So I was super excited. And he sat me down in the barber chair, gave me a cut, put on my uh, shark gray suit. Oh, that's what they call it, shark gray. And then went there. Met her at the end. It was a reception with cookies and all that good stuff. And I gave her my business card because, yes, pan, people at Pan are super pretentious. The warden culture make us all super professional. And we all carry business cards. Or many of us did. Not all of us did. But I did. I carried a business card. So I give her my business card. Um... We take pictures together. She's so impressed. She gives me her business card, which was a power move. And we take great pictures and I'm excited. My piece, okay, so back, let me back up a little bit. If you win the contest, which I won, not only does my 500 words, not only do I get the, got to meet her, but the words get published in HuffPost. So they published the piece on their website, which for me was a big deal. Now I know now, you know, Huffington Post or now it's HuffPost, things have changed. Ariana Huffington has left. But in that time period, 2012, it was hot to be on Huff, Huffington Post. Like HuffPost Live was great. It was a moment. Like people was really into that show and uh, into that website. I mean, I think they want to, I think nominate for a Pulitzer Prize. I mean, there was, it was a lot of great stuff happening at the time. It was, it was a very like, first of its kind, like mainstream, all digital news platform. I mean, they were popping and I was, it was a great moment. I mean, the exposure alone, right? 
So that got published. And then I remember I had her card. I sent a very touching email, just like this email, just saying, thank you so much for this and uh, this opportunity. And it was great to meet her. And I told her how much I love writing and, you know, kind of said something along the lines at the end of the email saying that, you know, um, you know, looking forward to one day being able to write for you all again and, and thank you and all this. So in another power move by the Ariana Huffington, she emails me back and she's like, well, you know, very brief email was like, you know, thank you for your kind remarks, Ernest, you know, and, and she CCs her editor, uh, one of the editors there. She says, if you like, we can set you up an account and you can post for us regularly. Listen, there's only a couple of times in my life where I've had one of these crazy, like frenetic, um, little Miss Sunshine moments. And I know you remember when a little girl, Abigail Breslin was, yelling and screaming when she found out she was going to be in the contest or whatever. That was my moment. I have had a couple of those moments in my life. I'll talk about another one of them in this episode. But I lost it. And next thing you know, I was writing nationally for them like on a regular basis. And the rest was really history. So I graduated from Penn in 2014. I got into this space of just the first year of graduation, just like evolving in my work. Um, I was doing all these odd end jobs and, 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 and quirks and things like that. One of the things that I was very big on was um, doing some work around, um, what was that? Uh, it was it was one thing that I really loved doing uh, that was based on some, some great work. It was, um, oh, I know what it was. It was about, uh, Entertainment. I was doing the BET Awards. I was doing all of these different award shows. I was just really going out and about trying to connect and, uh, you know, just basically get my journalism chops and things. And so that was really important to me. And so yeah, at that time, I did the BET Awards and um, was an apprentice under a BET executive who really gave me a lot of wisdom about the industry um, and really gave me a lot of um, information about, you know, why do I do the things that I do? You know, why why do I want to pursue this career? Why was this important to me? And it was hard at one point in time because I really was, you know, at this point in the industry where um, I was at a crossroads between do I want to be this red carpet guy or do I want to be a serious reporter or someone that that's really covering journalism on a more um, mature level. And so when I did these, um, you know, this apprenticeship and uh, did this work at the BT Awards, the Hip Hop Awards, all these things that summer 2014, I guess I really realized that I had a lot more to offer. I think, no, no shade to the people who do the entertainment reporting, but there is... You know, if you really want to do it, there's a, there's a lot of, of yourself that you sometimes have to, not everyone does this, let me just clarify, but just, there is a lot of shallowness that happens sometimes. Like, these companies, these studios, the, these, these, these executives, they're really big on access journalism. And it's, and I'm an adversarial journalist at heart which is like basically access journalism is all about meeting the people, getting the resource, getting the, have that direct contact. But if you're somebody who has opinions or you're somebody who doesn't agree with something, they'll cut your access off. I mean, we saw that under the Trump administration where, you know, certain journalists were not basically embraced for having different opinions and approaches. And that's still happening, you know, in the entertainment industry where, you know, if you write a bad re review about a movie or something, depending on who you are, they're not going to let you, you know, necessarily get access sometimes. And so that is something I didn't like. I didn't, I didn't really like that. I just thought that that was corny. And it put people in a position to basically brown nose, sometimes talentless hacks. And um, I quickly realized that that wasn't necessarily the space for me for what I was trying to do. But, you know, to each their own. So at this time, I got rugged. I decided I was going to do the startup stuff. You know, that shit, right? And I was like, I'm going to do a media startup. There was this uh, person in Philadelphia, a crook, who wanted to do a startup magazine. Got really excited. My friend laughed at me because this was real. See, I can laugh at this now because it was over five years ago. But see, when it was happening, I was not laughing. I was crying. But I was, you know, I did this work. 
you know, unpaid labor as a fellow with the intention to set this publication up so that I can then turn around and then become the um, editor in chief. And so this was my plan and I was going to get paid some money. At this point, I moved into my studio apartment. I was paying four fifty a month. And in 2014, this is when I was also, well, this was like starting in 2014. I had just got, I just graduated from college, but I just got in a relationship with the man who's like the love of my life. And it's going to be my husband this year, right? Like the 2021, you know, and you know, it was interesting, which I didn't want to get into that part. I, I, I do want to talk about my love life briefly, but not now. I'm going to say that. But at this time, we, my fiance, I'm at the, at right now, my fiance and I was just first dating in 2014 officially. And so I had all this in my stuff going on. I decided to stay in Philadelphia. Everybody thought I was going to run off to New York, which I didn't do. Thank God I didn't go to New York. Aren't you happy? <laughs> um, I mean, everybody should be happy. Philadelphia, depending on who you ask, they're like, man, I want that mother. Anyway, it, it was it was it was different different feelings. But anyway, I was super excited, and you know, I had went to LA a lot. I was doing a lot of like I said, media work. I was going to LA uh, back and forth, and I had went to um, Ghana and did some cool work, and you know, and this was when Ebola happened, and people were trying to tell me don't go to Africa. Listen, y'all was not going to take away my trip to the motherlands. I went to Ghana. The food was great. I love fisherman stew. I love red red. I loved it all. And I ate it all. And it was the best food in my life. And Ghana was everything. Fate, one of my favorite countries in Africa. Love Ghana. Love Ghana. And I also want to say, because I want to start, I want to start some mess. I want to start a riot. You know what I'm saying? Ghanaian or jollof rice is the best jollof rice. And Liberian is, is I too, if you're nasty. But Nigerian jollof rice is disgusting. And I just want to say that on this podcast. I know it's going to start some fights, and it's okay. I said what I said. And I know that if people feel some type of way, they can get into Twitter and say something. But I am going to start off the jollof war, wars again. Ghanaian jollof is the best jollof rice. And I don't judge you if you like Liberian jollof rice. It is good too. But the rest of them, no. Period. Okay, moving along. So, okay. I get into this startup, working with this woman. She doesn't know anything about publishing, but it was her baby. We're living lavish, like working lavish. We was in a private club downtown in Philadelphia. Um, you know, I didn't at the time. I was getting paid in meals on wheels, <laughs> but no, I was getting paid in the. I was not getting paid anything monetary. I didn't get any money. At the time, I was just basically showing up, um, strategizing, doing editorial um, work, like basically hustling to get this off the ground. But we were working in nice space. You know, we were at the Pyramid Club. We was at these nice places that had, you know, lavish stuff. So it was it was a nice setup. Right. I was very much like enjoying the fact that I was able to drink a martini at like 2 p.m. and have a, a, a delicious T-bone steak. I mean, this was good times, but I wasn't getting paid. So when the magazine, you know, the digital magazine officially launched, I then had to, you know, start off that year. That was 2015, January 2015. I was supposed to start getting paid. Well, this person, this this startup person, whoever, did not pay me, uh, gave me the run around, gave, gave me the, the loop around. And when it was all said and done, I was basically put in a position where it was like, if you want this money, you're going to have to take me to small claims court, to which... The amount of money that I needed was not would have, the, the the money I would have gone through to do small claims court and do all that supersede would have superseded um, the money I needed. So I was in a hole. I was screwed over. And every every hero has a journey, and every hero gets screwed over. I don't know any self made successful person that hasn't been fucked over. But that was like my fucked over moment. That was my like oh my goodness I've been screwed, and this was real. I was pissed. So I had two decisions and one of them meant that I had to sign a deal with the devil for five seconds. And that was to go work at Comcast. So I worked at Comcast as a programming coordinator um, for only a couple of weeks. And I was working there. I was, I was, you know, in the job and 
I did not like it. I knew I didn't like it, but everyone around me was so happy that I had moved on up, moving on up. Like people get so excited when you get a corporate job. You tell somebody you starting a business or you self-discovering or you're doing something like independent, folks be like, oh, okay, that's cute. But when you when you do a corporate job and you don't have any, you doing something you hate, everybody around you happy for you except for yourself. <clears throat> and that was something that was frustrating. Like I was in a position where I, I was not happy. But I had to pay them bills. And, you know, you know, at the time, though, which was interesting is that when I was in college, I interned for a lot of places, including City Hall. I was a communications fellow for Philadelphia City Council. And during that time, I had met a great woman that was working there who put me on and connected me. And, I, and I, she knew I wanted to be a journalist. And she wanted to connect me and she found, she sent my, she sent my information to a, a, a Metro Philly, which is the free paper in Philadelphia. There's a Metro Boston, a Metro New York. And she sent my, I think, resume there or something and got me connected to an editor there who wanted to work with me. And at the time, it was a freelance situation. And I was like, I could do a couple of these on the side while I was working at Comcast. So I was like doing it. But as I got deep into it, the first story I did for Metro Philly that was, which is interesting, was I interviewed that, that baseball phenomenon uh, known as Monet Davis. I interviewed this young black woman who, young black woman who was talented, gifted. She had a book that she co-wrote with a woman that I'm really cool with named Hillary Beard. And this, this one, this, this experience of interviewing her got me my reporter chops. I really got into reporting because a lot of my opinion writing I did in college was the Earnest Opinion, which was a which was a column I did at the Daily Pennsylvanian when I was there, which was an interesting experience because the Daily Pennsylvanian was a college paper, and you know I was a columnist there for a couple of years, won some awards while I was in college. While I was in college, I was doing the newspaper, the radio, the TV show. I was doing everything. I was I was doing the most, but loved it nonetheless. But anywho, I wanted to do some reporting, and so this got me my chops. So I took this freelance gig with Metro Philly. I was all over Philadelphia. Okay, this is before Uber was popping and Uber was like, you know, had these great prices or rates, whatever, Uber's a mess. But anyway, I was taking the L, the Frankfurt Metro L, the the, 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 the trolley, the subway, whatever was under Metro, what SEPTA, public transportation in Philadelphia, that's what I was taking. And I was going everywhere. I was just just all over Philadelphia, um, covering all kind of weird stories, earth ships. Um, the MOVE march um, when, when they was commemorating the MOVE bombing where Philadelphia dropped a bomb on its own citizens and killed a black child. I encourage you all to watch 40 Years a Prisoner that's on HBO Max right now that is by um, Michael Africa that talks about this experience um, as a descendant of the MOVE family and really paints the picture of what happened with the move bombing, which is now over 35 years ago. It happened in 1985, in May of 1985. And, and, and the, the mayor of this city, Mayor Jim Kenney of Philadelphia, who's a pig, um, basically has refused to apologize, but the city council has authorized a uh, formal apology that I don't even think was signed by every city councilman, which was disgusting, but those who did including the city councilwoman of that district, which is in my district. I live in the district where the move bombing took place, which was in Osage Avenue. Um, West Philadelphia, which is where I live, and the current city councilwoman, um, or member now, they say city council member now, um, more gender neutral, but she, you know, basically is, her name is Jamie Gautier, and she um, is representing this area. And it's, 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 her work that she's been doing thus far has really been, you know, in this space of trying to just move, literally move, move forward in a way that, um, you know, let the city acknowledges the disrespect that they did back then. But I digress. So I don't know where I was. I was covering a lot of stuff for Metro um, while I was still doing the Comcast gig. And eventually I left Comcast quickly. Less than a month I was out of there and just jumped into this um, freelancing universe at Metro um, full time. But not as a full time employee, but I was getting more assignments that I was able to you know, pay my rent. 
um, keep myself afloat and everything like that. During that time, I got, I was interested in opinion writing and I asked them that I want to do a column. The editor at the time said, sure, write one. Let's see how it goes. And let's see if this is a thing that you can do. And I said, okay, cool. That column was called Woody's Not So Fetch. And it was in 2015. And I wrote about what it was like to go to Woody's back in the day. And how there was a lot of racial discrimination happening at bars in the LGBTQ community, which in Philadelphia is known as the neighborhood, which is in New York is known as the village. Chicago is known as Boys Town. Houston is known as Montrose. L.A. is just L.A. No, West Hollywood. Um, and other parts of the country have these like gay sectors and areas. I mean, Atlanta pretty much is just Atlanta, right? Just what, Morehouse, they call it. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, but like any any area that is, um, you know, has a a high um, uh, population of restaurants, gay bars, gay restaurants, um, where people frequent, and you know, there's culture, arts, and things, right? Yeah, yeah. That's other things happen there. No. Okay. I, I would just other things happen. Things happen at right. Okay. So I don't know. I, what do I know? I was Little Red Riding Hood. Oh, drag queen, what big wig you have. <laughs> the better to slay you with, my dear. Yes. Oh, what big heels you have. Oh. The better to stomp you out, bitch. No, I'm joking. Ooh, but it was interesting. I mean, I was when I first went to the neighborhood as a young bull, as they say in Philly, I definitely was like Little Red Riding Hood. I didn't know. I mean, there was definitely a lot of wolves. <laughs> a lot of wolves. Mm. <laughs> So, I wrote about that there was this racial division, right? That when you go to the dance floor, you could see the separation. You could see the 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 fetishization of black and brown uh, people. You could see how we were unicorns. We, you could see how we were treated weird in our own community that was supposed to be our community, right? But what I learned and continue to learn is that racial identity... Sexual orientation does not shield you from the racial oppression that you can face in these communities. We see this with feminism. We see this with, with womenhood, right? Where black women are still being disrespected by other women outside of their community. And that happened in the LGBTQ community. And I always tell people that one identity doesn't speak to another identity. So just because you are white and queer doesn't shield you from being racist, right? And that was something that a lot of people did not understand at that time. So I wrote this op-ed. It goes viral. A lot of people are talking about it. I get a lot of press about it in Philadelphia. And it starts this larger conversation in the city about these issues. And at the time, when I first wrote this, there was a lot of folks that didn't want to believe me. They didn't want to uh, give me my props. They didn't give my, what they, give my gots. There was a lot of people that was haters. And there were people, that some people that was like, yeah, he's making sense. I started to change that org petition. To call it out, you know, I start to meet people who become lifelong friends. Um, at the time, I was a reporter, so we didn't really bond then. But I started to see people in the community rise up and activists rise up and, 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 and people who were community organizers rise up. And I quickly began to fall into this interest in this beat. Fast forward to 2016, early 2016, I take a position at Philadelphia Magazine as their LGBTQ editor. And when I take this position, it's an opportunity for me to really, one, I'm now the shit at this point. People are like, wait, this guy's at Philadelphia Magazine? Like, Philadelphia Magazine, as you know, is one of the most successful regional magazines in America. We've been around for over 100 years. It's a, it's, it's, it's got a history that is definitely um, a history that is racist, just like any other publication that was out um, and still out. It has a history that has went through so many different changes. And I feel like where we're at now is at our most uh, promising, I think. And I wouldn't be there if it wasn't. I've been there now for five years and it's been a, it's been a journey. It's been um, a place that has definitely have given me opportunities to write about things 
that no other place was going to accept. And how I know, because I've applied to every major publication in the city in some capacity. I've either freelanced for them or I've either written for them or done something for them. And so people saw the talent, but this was the place that opened the door. So I'm going to always have a special place for Philadelphia Magazine because they saw the talent in me. And they also knew the value I was going to bring. Like it was a mutual exchange, but it was the fact that they decided to say yes, right? I, I respect that. And I will say that every article, every op-ed, everything you see me write for them, that's my, those are my words. Those are my pitches. Those are my decisions. And I, I'm picking the stories I write and I have that autonomy there. And, you know, I'm grateful and privileged to be able to do that in an industry where too often black voices are often silenced, edited, revised, rewritten. That's my voice on all of those pages and all of those paragraphs and pixels. So when I came to Philadelphia Magazine 2016, I began to delve into investigating the neighborhood racism. Um, it was my beat. It was my passion as the LGBTQ editor. I was, I was the only person in the team. It was like, I'm an editor, but I was the editor, writer, everything. I was a one-man band, um, pretty much, with the exception of my great editor, Tim, um, who was the editorial director at the time. But at, but at that moment, I was really diving deep. So I was covering, there was a bar at the time called Eye Candy that did the no Tim's policy, no Timberland boots policy. These idiots had a no Timberland boots policy. Where they do that at? I was just completely confused. Like what was they thinking? A no Timberlands policy? Anyway, they had the no Timberlands policy. There was um, bars being accused of you know, having racially themed nights, which people was doing that, Latino nights. Hip hop nights, Jamaican nights, you know, and people still do that to this day, which is very telling. What does that mean, right? Because if it's a club, there's mostly white people. What they doing in there? They can't. What they're gonna do to Adele? They're gonna come in there with the with the with the outfit on like Adele, get the bantu knots, child. So it was a lot of this going on, a lot of of interesting politics, a lot of um, interesting stuff that was happening, and. I was just exposing all of it, you know, um, an incredible activist group called the Black and Brown Workers Collective, which is now the Black and Brown Workers Cooperative, the BBWC, which was then led by Shani Akil and Abdul Ali Muhammad, which both of them are, are great leaders and people that I have respected and have, have gotten to know um, outside of this work. But they led a coalition of black and brown, non-binary people, trans people, and and, and, and queer folks that of, of color that came out there and fought the power. I mean, they were protesting and showing up. I mean, I can't even tell you all the memories. I mean, there was one protest in September of 2016. They came down to, to eye candy, which was that bar. And they got Timberland boots and they tied it to the door, y'all. It was it was it was a moment, man. And I was out there always putting everything on Facebook Live for G Philly, which was the LGBTQ section of Philly Mag. It was called G Philly. And I would just go out there in the streets in my shorts with my beach shirt, because that was my comfortable wear. And I would go out there with my Facebook Live and record it. And and the, and and we was just out there. Like the revolution was digitized. The revolution was live. Instagram, Facebook Live. We we did it all. And I and I kept some of that footage. And it was it was it was powerful. And what ended up coming out of all of that, I mean, first of all, let me just say the breakthrough was that during my time, I ended up getting a source that sent me a video, a YouTube video of the owner of Eye Candy referring to his black patron, his former black employee as an N-word on camera. And when that happened, forget the fact that I had already talked about all these other microaggressions. But for some reason, white people don't believe you until someone said the N-word. White people don't believe you until there's a Ku Klux Klan um, mad hood or mask and, or, or Confederate flag or something, you know, or a swastika. They won't believe you until there's that, that, that smoking gun, right? So when this happens, all of a sudden city government, who didn't give a fuck at all, didn't do anything, didn't say anything. When this happens, oh, oh, hell, oh, hell breaks loose. So now they show up, they want to do a town hall. I go up in there in a, in a Kenti cloth attire daishiki that I got from Ghana, which again, I told you I love Ghana. I go up there and I speak my truth. 
I come up there in full dashiki. Beautiful. It was iconic. And I'm in there at that town hall, at that listening session, whatever they want to call it, hearing. It was a public hearing. That's what they called it. And I'm in there speaking my truth. And then sure, but soon but surely, more protest happens. And then the city finally steps up. They release a report in 2017 that references the work that I did, the work that the Black and Brown Workers um, Cooperative did, and acknowledges that racism in LGBT community, community is a thing, an institutional thing that had been going on for several decades and that they were working to do sensitivity trainings for the bar owners. But then there was a law that was passed by council member Derek Green that puts tougher sanctions on commercial properties, including those in the neighborhood, that if they are racially profiled and doing discriminatory behavior against the fair ordinance practice, that they could potentially lose their commercial license, which was never a thing until this policy happened. Because at first they would just get fines, a little slap on the wrist, a little, you know, whatever. But that was it. They was um they was doing they was doing their thing or whatever like that. And that was a transformational experience because a lot of these people did not have those um resources or that kind of integrity to do what needs to be done. And I think that that was one of the frustrating things about it uh, was that, you know, they need to have a policy that scared these people into submission, scared these people into knowing you have to do something. And if you didn't do something, that this was going to happen. We had to turn up for them to show up. We had to turn up for them to show up. And that was the community. Those are people who weren't paid. They weren't paid organizers. They didn't get any funding. We didn't even get support by the local NAACP. Most of these black politicians and, and, and white politicians, nobody really showed up for us except, I would say, Derek Green as a black elected official. You know, Donna Bullock, who was a state rep at the time. A couple of folks that were, I mean, I guess what they call them, allies. They <laughs> showed up, but it was not that many. A lot of them ignored it. And I'm just looking like, we are black queer people being racially discriminated. If we were straight black people in Philadelphia that was getting racially discriminated by a white bar or club in Philadelphia, these people would have been, what Ben Crump would have been down here. It would have been a thing, right? It would have been a whole show. But because we were queer, we were facing this discrimination, not only by racist white people, but by homophobic black people. It was real. They didn't care because we were queer. They didn't care because they had already, in their mind, kicked us out of our houses. So what we did down there was none of their business. And that was really what it felt like. And so to have you know, Derek Green, to have certain people step up and make sure that we were taken care of and advocated for and to see that policy happen, that was a moment. And what also came in that moment was that, you know, a couple of people got fired, right? Office of LGBT Affairs Director who was in that role at the time, don't even need to name her name because she's that irrelevant. She got fired. Um, what ended up happening, well, she, she, she'd like to say she resigned. It ain't a resignation that they told you back. She got fired. Um, what ended up happening next was that we got black and brown stripes on the pride flag. And to be one of the influencers of that happening as a black journalist that broke those stories that brought this back into the public eye 30 years after no one was talking about it in mainstream media, to see the work of the black and brown workers collective, to see that community anchor that was pretty much, in my opinion, the angelic troublemakers, the small core is how we was described by the mayor, to see us and that work be translated into an iconic symbol that now is being used around the world, um, to me, is real. And even though the person who, again, another person who's not going to be named because they're irrelevant in this situation, in my opinion, was the official, the city official that helped get it there. It was our work that made that happen. And so I give the credit to the black and brown people in Philadelphia, the activists who were out there on the ground. I'm gonna give myself a little pat on the back because sometimes self-acknowledging is necessary. And I'm gonna say that that's how it was done and that's the story and I'm sticking with that. So while this happened, my career uh, changed rapidly. I mean, I began to build a real social media following. I started to get national attention. Um, I, I began to be someone that people looked at as the real McCoy. Um, 
you know, it's 2017, 2018. I'm getting published in BT. I'm getting published, you know, New York Times come a couple years later. I'm getting published at MTV News. Uh, where else? NPR appearances. The Daily Beast, the list goes on. I just was, I was just, I was glowing. I was growing. I was glowing. Things were working. And in this process, I began to realize my value as a black media producer and as a journalist. And I started my own business called Ernest the Media Empire LLC in 2018, which is a media production consulting communications company um, that really is doing a damn thing. You know, I, I love my business. Um, under this business is how I got grant money to actually produce this podcast. Um, I always tell the people that I work with media companies, not for them. There's a difference. And I'm able to get contracts by media companies that I work with currently to produce that work and also be, be able to provide that independent voice. So I work for myself and I get contracts from companies like Philadelphia Magazine, Daily Beast, The Brio, and others to produce content for them. And it's an interesting, fascinating journey. Um, because, you know, a lot of people don't do that that way. And I'm very blessed and fortunate to be able to have this type of, you know, relationship with the editorial spaces, but it was important to, you know, have my own voice and to understand it. So, you know, I, I pay for my own health insurance. I pay for my own laptop. I pay my own bills, got my own house. Not just, but no, really, I mean, I, I do a lot of those things independently and I love that the relationship is about the content. And I don't feel obligated uh, to companies in certain other ways because I've seen so many of my friends get in the business and I stopped seeing all these layoffs and said, I got to find a new way to make this work for me because I saw so many people in the industry get exploited. I've seen so many specifically black freelance writers uh, not get that opportunity to shine and, and to not, they're too busy worried about chasing checks and following editors down for money, but they don't even have the time to really think about it. So for me, it was about building stability and consistency in this field to do it. But while I'm also been exploring the world, I've really been invested in advocacy. You know, advocacy has played a major role in my career. It's played a major role in why I do what I do, you know, um, that's important to me, right? Knowing why I do what I do. And a lot of that comes from just being an outspoken person. And sometimes that shit has gotten me in some shit. <laughs> so one of the most interesting things that's happened to me um, was nearly five years ago, what, 2016, it was Justin Timberlake. Um, for those who don't know about this, this is how I kind of got a little Twitter famous. I guess it's my, this is my black Twitter moment. This is my contribution to the culture. Um, so it was the BET Awards in 2016. I was watching the BET Awards. At this point, I wasn't at the BET Awards. I was at the BET Awards in 2014. But 2016, I was watching it. And this was the night when that actor, Jesse Williams, had given this very, you know, brilliant speech about Black culture, Black Lives Matter, uh, activism, exploitation of Black excellence. I think he referenced Black people being gold or having, you know, our, 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 our gold being extracted. And just, it was just deep. It was, it was hella deep and I was here for it. And so Justin Timberlake, okay, Justin, y'all know Justin Timberlake, JT. Um, <laughs> basically, Justin Timberlake gets on Twitter. He's talking about stuff. He's inspired or, or something. I'm looking like, how you, if you don't shut your ass up. I just had a, a, a just a very, like, frustrated annoyedness like i can't describe how much i can't stand justin timberlake but i was sitting here looking like how sway how do you have this inspiration what does this mean and so you know what i did at that time i only had two thousand followers i was not verified i was uh what they would they, some of these people would consider me a nobody on twitter but see they like to respond to the nobody girls i said like, stop messing with them nobody you don't know who people be but i got on twitter I responded to him and I said, so does this mean you're going to apologize for, you know, appropriating black culture and Janet Jackson, you're going to apologize to Janet Jackson and, and culturally appropriating and, and all that? And he tells me, oh, you sweet soul, the more you realize we're the same and yada, yada, yada. He basically all white lives matter. Me, He called me a sweet soul, which I don't understand what he was trying to do there. I don't know if he was trying to throw shade. I don't know what he was trying to do. But I go off on Twitter and it goes viral. Basically, people are retweeting my response to him. It becomes local news, national news, global news. I'm on the front cover of Metro 
which at this time I was a nationally syndicated columnist. So my column was was um, in Philadelphia, Boston, and New York. And I was one of the youngest black columnists, syndicated columnists at the time. Um, really one of the youngest columnists at the time. I was like, I, I was 24 at the time when that happened. And maybe even I got, to, yeah, 24. I was like 24, damn, I was young. But I was doing it like in that moment. And so I was on the front cover of Metro um, and it got all this attention. And, you know, BT asked me to write an op-ed. I got a writing contract, writing about my experience with Justin Timberlake. But then that opened me up because people realized, oh, snap, he's a journalist. So I was all over the internet, all over the media. I was everywhere. And that viral moment, you know, really, in addition to all the other work I did, kind of catapulted my career and moved me um, in a different way. But I, I still kept that same energy because that's just who I was. I, it wasn't him. Next thing I know, I'm getting into it with Charlamagne the God on Twitter, who is a terrible person. Um, he actually made me donkey of the day. I was actually donkey of the day on Charlamagne the God show, The Breakfast Club. Yes. And this was when oh he, iconic, right? I don't even talk about that. I was donkey of the day that because he actually defended Justin Timberlake, actually, which is funny. He's always in proximity to whiteness when it comes to black issues, especially when it comes to throwing black women under the bus and LGBTQ folk. But I digress. I can never fuck with him after what he did to. Allow that little Duval to haul. Disrespectful. Disrespectful. Transphobic. This dude, you know, who, you know, y'all like him with that smile, bitch. Smile, bitch. That dude, that transphobe, that little Duval, grown ass man call himself little because his consciousness is little. And he's probably little in other spaces too. He basically said, made a joke or thought he was making a joke about killing black trans women. And was unapologetic about it. And thought that was okay. And, 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 and Charlemagne is egging him on. And everybody thinks that was cute. And nobody checked him on the episode. And so I have no respect for the Breakfast Club. I don't have any interest in going to the Breakfast Club. Don't ask me. Don't want to go. As long as he's on there. You know. And I sometimes get disappointed with Angela Yee. And also, we, we know DJ Envy. Mm, child, bless his heart. But like Angela Yee, you know, she is credible. She's got an award. She's a real, to me, a real media professional. But sometimes she's, I just wonder, I don't know. I just wonder how she really feels being on that show with this idiot. And, you know, Charlamagne the God, of course, you know, a lot of times they always, mainstream media loves to get the dumbasses of our field and amplify them. Like this idiot is, is interviewing Joe Biden for a presidential race. He's he's out here talking on shows like MSNBC and other spots weighing in on politics when there's so many legitimate black reporters that cover these issues that don't get those platforms. But, you know, that's just how the industry do. Like they treat they don't respect black art, black talent, black consciousness as much. You have to fight for it. I to this day have to fight to get access. But I digress. But anywho, I got into it with him. I got doxxed by a certain king but that's not Martin Luther King Talcum X is who I call how I call him and he docks me on Twitter and you know decides that he wants to he's mad because I'm calling him out on his shenanigans because a lot of people know that Talcum X is a fraud Talcum X has done a lot of things that has been harmful to black and brown people specifically black women black activists black queer writers um and I was one of the people who was a victim to his very outlandish, targeted bully. I critiqued him on a tweet. He finds this tweet months, months later, decides to put me out there on Twitter. His massive, crazy ass following decides to follow me all on all of my accounts, harassing me, my partner, putting crazy stuff. It's been written before. It's a lot that's been written. But I had those receipts, right? The receipts that the publications and the stuff that he said he was going to do, they weren't legit. They weren't real. People were getting fired. Stuff was not together. And everyone was waiting. But I was I was investigator earnest on that case. And, you know, in these moments where I have spoken up on social media, you know, there has been moments where it has helped amplify and elevate marginalized people who, you know, who don't oftentimes have the same platform. Like now I got, you know, over 20,000 Twitter followers. I'm verified on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I, I have some clout. And I'm in a place where now I'm invested in 
utilizing it for good, utilizing it for empowerment, information. And sometimes I throw my shade, like anybody else. I'm going to talk about how annoying Meek Mill is. I'm going to talk about how ridiculous some of these, 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 these Fox movements are. But I'm also going to use the opportunity to amplify um, folks who aren't getting those platforms to talk and to share their stories. And a lot of the work that I do is centered on my blackness, sometimes my queerness, sometimes other aspects, but blackness is always in the conversation. And mm -hmm. that is something that's always been important to me in my work. And as I began to, you know, get into this realm, other opportunities come up, you know, I got on the Forbes 30 under 30 list, um, in 2000, it was a 20, I'm, a, I'm a part of the class of 2020 for the Forbes 30 under 30 list. And I was, you know, it's interesting because at my school, my alma mater, Penn, which is known for producing the most billionaires, of the most billionaires, I think we produce the most billionaires out of any other college. One of the things that we have done is that what, what I have done, at least, is that I have I'm, I was surprised because our our school, my alma mater, the type of people that get on that list are often people who do startups that come from money, rich kids, folks that that really do stuff they hate or just do stuff to get thirsty enough to get on the list. But I wasn't actually trying to campaign to get on the list. Like I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a Forbes connection. I didn't pay payola. I didn't do anything. I didn't do payola. I didn't, I didn't do anything. They just told me I was on the list. And 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 that was interesting to me because, I, I, again, it was, it was really the work. And, you know, that was a moment for me where I realized that what I'm doing and how I'm doing it is my success. I think too often, this is just me just going super deep right now, but it's real though. Too often, you know, we get in situations where when we're in any type of industry, it doesn't even have to be journalism or music or whatever, everyone around you is telling you there's only one pathway to be successful or to achieve a certain goal. They don't see your vision. They don't see what you're going to do to make the difference for your career. They don't understand how it has to make sense for you and that your experiences is what shape your decision making to make those things happen the way you need them to happen. And I know that's a little weird, but like basically I am a proponent that every single person can achieve what they need to achieve in their own way. And everybody has different times when they can achieve it. Could I have gotten on the Forbes 30 under 30 list a different way, a lot faster? Sure. But to me, the success is being able to get things, being yourself and doing it on your own terms. It's so easy to figure out the quote unquote, the blueprint to getting certain things. Like there's a blueprint to getting a Grammy. If you don't believe me, I can tell you. There's a blueprint to getting an Oscar. There's a blueprint to getting certain things. There's like a, a whole metric that will increase your likelihood. I don't know why it hasn't worked for Glenn Close yet. I don't know why it hasn't worked for Amy Adams yet because I, I love them, okay? I don't understand why at this point in the game, Glenn Close does not have an Oscar. I'm, I'm hoping that by the time this podcast, this whole podcast series, that she will have had an Oscar by now or Amy Adams. I don't know, but I just need, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Anyway. There's a metric, right? There's a method to getting these things. And people know how to play the game. Taylor Swift knows how to play the game, okay? A lot of it is already played for her. She's a white woman that's young, that is attractive to the people that think she's attractive. And she's able to get success off of a lot of her white privilege. She's also super talented, too. So super talented plus white privilege equals bona fide, bona fide success, right? But black and talented, you got to add in some other factors. And we know that for a lot of other people. So privilege does play a role in this. And you see it. You see it all the time. Like, what is it going to fucking take for Beyonce to get an album to your Grammy? And you know what? Who gives a fuck if she gets one? Now, she doesn't need one. But I'm just saying, like, when you're talking about, if we're talking, like, the politics of it all, what does it take? What does it take? I don't know. What? She got to do with Tony Bennett? She got to do a Tony Bennett collaboration. She got to do a jazz number. Like, it got to be, you know, yes, duets. Tony Bennett and, and, and Herbie Hancock and Beyonce. It's going to be called the Creole Letters. And she's going to do, like, these old jazz songs. And she's going to have Herbie Hancock in the background. And Tony Bennett going to give you some accent. And that's how she's going to get her Grammy. Bet. That's what they do. 
Look at Robert Plant, Raising Sands, Allison Cross. Look at them. You know where you know where he came from, Robert Plant? He couldn't get an album of the year Grammy with his oats. Let me stop. See, that's my music nerd coming out. But like I said, that's what it seemed like it's going to have to take. These people got to get super old. They said we have to get super old and give us a jazz legacy album, and then they'll probably give her an album of the year. They're not going to give it to her while she's hip and hot. But that's because she's black. But Taylor Swift might be on her way to getting a third album of the year. <laughs> And the fact that Gaga has not gotten an album of the year Grammy at, at, ever, like, the, anyway, I'm just, not that she deserves it for Chromatica, let me, let me clarify that, but, or, or Joanne, let me clarify that too, but I'm just saying, there's been other records that Gaga has put out that definitely, like, Fame Monster or something, I don't know, child, it's been better music, um, the Grammys haven't been getting it right forever, I don't know, the last time the Grammys got it right, maybe, Outcast, The Love Below. No, Adele for 21. And then after that, everybody else was one. Mm. Well, I, I I did, I did, I did like, um, oh my goodness, you know, um, K Casey Musgraves' um, Golden Hour. I thought that was well-deserved, I guess. Uh, I thought that was good. I don't really know who she went against that year, but I thought that was a great, I thought that was a great album to win. I wasn't really crazy about Bruno Mars because Bruno Mars should not won for 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 twenty four karat magic whatever. You know Kendrick Lamar should won for damn a Pulitzer Prize winning album. Okay, I'm just ranting about that, but I just no. It what I'm trying to get to the the moral of the story is is that a lot of times you don't know um, you don't know who who what the wins are. I mean. I would even say, I like Billie Eilish too. Billie Eilish deserved for that album. She did. I liked it. I mean, for that. Yeah, I did like that. I mean, that was a great album. Um, but again, I digress. It, it's a lot of um, interesting things that have happened over the years. I'll just say that much. But I think what's been the most important to me has been just recognizing how things have changed. Oh, people thought that I oh they thought that Cardi B evasion of privacy should have won. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I I I, I would have I don't know about that. Let me not don't get me started. But um I mean people liked invasion of privacy. I liked invasion of privacy. I don't know if saying no if it should have been album of the year. The nomination was good, but I don't I don't know if it should have been album of the year. When it was Dirty Pink, Computer by Janelle Monae, which was I, yeah, yeah, I think, I think Casey Musgraves deserved. I don't, yeah, Casey. The rest of the cat, the song albums, they were good, but I don't think they touched what she was doing with Golden Hour. But I digress. So, anywho, getting on Forbes 30 on 30 was a great achievement because I didn't actually do anything to get it um, outside of just being great and just being talented. But furthermore, as time began to progress, I really got really interested in advocacy work on the industry level. I'm a big advocate for freelancers. I care about freelancers. Freelancers matter. Black, freelance ma black freelancers matter. And you know, some of these places don't even pay for black publications, okay? We was doing hashtag Ebony O's because Ebony was not actually out here playing black journalists. But some of these people were showing up to these Ebony Power 100 list of things, damn well not getting giving the gods to the writers. But, that, you know, again, I believe in that. I'm, a, I'm an advocate for that. Um, I believe in abolishing the police. Um, I don't support the prison industrial system. Um, I support LGBTQIA rights, uh, black trans rights, black trans lives matter. Um, I'm not crazy about capitalism. I don't, you know, I, I, I wouldn't call myself a communist, but I definitely don't support gross American capitalism. I don't support Republicans, <laughs> bigots, white supremacists. I don't really like the two-party system. I'm more of an independent than, a, I would say, a Democrat at this point. But sometimes, you know, you just have to push one or the other. And I knew that with this election, I had to do what I had to do, but I had to hold my nose. But I'm not really crazy about the Democratic Party. I'm not really crazy about the Republican Party. Both of them are fucked up, in my opinion. But one is, I ain't gonna say, le one is less fucked up. Or one is better at they both are fucked up. Um, but I still vote. I do vote. I understand people don't vote, but I do vote. I got to vote. And um, what else? 
I have support. What else do I support? I, I support uh, women's rights, pro-choice. A woman needs to be able to choose what to do with her body. Some of these men don't even make decisions what to do with they. So, you know, wash your ass before you tell a woman what to do with her vagina. Let's just do that, men. Wash your ass before you decide to tell a woman how to what to do with her vagina. Some men need to be worried about their own body prices. And, they, the, and bush. It, the bush, too? Yes, the, the bush. bush. All of it. All of it. Yes, all of it. And that and that fuba, too. When you lift it up, clean under there, too. <laughs> or they call it a fuba. Lift under that, too. But worry about yourself. It's a lot of men. I'm such... And I saw, too, I'm a, I'm a huge... I, I'm a feminist. I support women's rights. And I'm very critical. I could drag a man just as good. Like, I listen. I, you know, cishet men, y'all, chow, the... It's not a war against this hat man, but I just want them to do better. I want to do better to queer people, trans people, women of all backgrounds and identities, non-binary people, everybody. I just I just need cis hat men across all racial lines to step up their shit. And and just let us live and fuck the patriarchy. So I'm all about that. I'm all about that. And and I support all of that. Um my religious beliefs, I, I grew up Pentecostal, you know. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I I um if you get it you get it if you don't you don't um R I P grandma you know I didn't mean it but I would say that I identify as a deist and so you know it's not like Kabbalah or any of these other religious religions like the Madonnas and folks who I I I believe that there is some type of divine intervention in it, of it in all but I don't know I think it's 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 like there was that but then nature happens and life happens and it's a mindset and it's a um it's an experience and you know transcendentalism I, I think you know for me I'm I'm I am spiritual I don't necessarily consider myself religious um I do believe that there is a discernment and there is a a, a higher a ground, but there is also this separation between that from the earth and what we see in the universe and those things. And sometimes those things do occur. So I, I would say that I am a moderate deist. Um, you know, I just, I don't really believe in organized religion. Um, do I celebrate Christmas? Yes, but I don't celebrate Christmas because of a particular, you know, religious belief. I just like gifts and like seeing people eat and uh, I just like kind of like, I like that, uh, you know, uh, Christmas tree is cute too. I mean, who doesn't like a Christmas tree? I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't, I don't follow it in that kind of way. I'm just not crazy about it like that. Um, but my family is, is definitely religious and, and they'll let you know, but they're not like crazy. Religious. I, I I grew up in the South. So my, my grandmother who um, is no longer here on earth, um, she Every summer, we, I used to go to Marianna, Arkansas. And if you thought you knew country, child, there was no Walmart there. And going to Walmart in Forest City, which I found out was the facility that I think T.I. was at when he was locked up. But that was in Arkansas. Forest City is like a, a big prison complex area where there was a, it's a couple of miles away from Marianna, Arkansas. And we used to go down there and go to Walmart. And, and we used to think Walmart was Disney World. Capitalism, y'all, bear with me. But growing up, the only thing that was there was a sonic drive through in Mariana, and that was the most exciting aspect of Mariana, Arkansas. And that in churches. They had a bunch of churches. There was more churches than there were pharmacies. Well, there was pharmacies and churches, but there was nothing else. Like movie theaters, there were no movie theaters. There were even there were barely any movie rental places. It was a very town where all we watched was soap operas. I knew all the soap operas growing up. I watched Jeopardy. I watched Cable, and it was hot as hell. It was so hot you crack an egg on the pavement. Um, we used to go to church Wednesdays and Sundays, and sometimes Saturdays. And you know, it was interesting. It was interesting. It was an interesting experience looking looking up. I mean, that's how I learned how to do public speaking because my grandma used to make me go up and do poems and things at the church. Yes. I was good at it too. I used to get all, I used to practice in front of her. She used to always clap for me. And I used to, she used to always want me to do speeches like MLK. Like everything was always in this type of sermon way. You know, you had to do it. You had to, you come up there. I used to get up there and say, good morning, everybody. My name is Ernest Owens. And I am here to give a speech that was written by Langston Hughes about and I would give the speech, and they were all clapping everything. They thought I was doing it, so that's how I would get my my my, my public performance. You know, I was a good old church queen, <laughs> young church queen. 
<laughs> but <laughs> but I was good. I was I was good at that, and that was um, how I got my public speaking experience. Mm. I don't think I ever told that story out loud. Mm. But um, so yeah, all of that background, um, you know that that experience shaped my my politics and, and it shapes my my faith and, and and for everything understanding. You know, I'm definitely. Um, a world travel person. I've traveled places. I've I've been to Israel. I've been to Ghana. I've been to Peru. Um, I've been to North Philly. I've been to South Philly. I've been to West Philly. I've been to LA. No, joking. No, I've, I've been abroad a little bit. I, I hate traveling. I'm not a very travely person, fun fact. Um, I don't know. Like, I mean, I just think, I'm just so, see, I'm, see, I'm weird. I don't know. But I'm very, like, I believe vacation is a state of mind. When I hear people say they have to get out and go to vacation, I'm like, what are you running from? Where are you running from? Where are you going? And I mean, listen, some people know how to do it. I don't know how to do that. I don't know if I know how to vacation or I just don't like being away from things. I don't know. Is it detached? I don't know what it is. I mean, I can detach myself from... I can detach myself. I just think that when it comes to spaces, I, I don't know. Like, I'm not hype about like... And everybody's like, oh, I got to go to Paris to have this vacation. Let's get uh, go to a beach. You know, I hate the beach. I'm not crazy about the beach. I mean, I'll go for five minutes, but this is cute. Let me take a couple of pictures. Like when I went to Israel, we was at the Dead Sea. We was at the, we, now that was fun because we was in the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea mud. Now that was fun. I rubbed it all over my body. I was over there floating, floating on that sea salt. Now I love that. That was a good time. But I'm not crazy about the beach like that. Like when I think of the beach, I think of that song. Let's go to the beach, beach. Let's get away. Wait, wait. And I said, you know what? Fuck the beach. I'm not going to the beach. Thank you, Nikki, for ruining it with starships. But no, I'm not crazy about the beach. And I think part of it is because of the fact that, oh my goodness, I don't, mm, I don't know. It's just hot. It's just sand, crabs. Jaws. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't see it. I don't see it for the. I don't. I don't. Jaws. Yeah, jaws. I don't. I don't see it for the. Uh, for the. For the. For that. Um. So I guess I have to talk about my personal life a little bit, right? Um. I've talked about my career. I guess. Oh, before I get into, I guess my personal life, cause y'all. That's what y'all are here for. That's the part y'all read. That's the mess. So to my personal life, where I'm at currently in my career, I'm the editor at large for Philadelphia Magazine. Um, I'm currently doing great things with my business. I'm a national writer, you know, with the Daily Beast. Been writing for them, and, and I love the work I'm doing with them. I still contribute to other pair of publications nationally, like the Griot. Um, I'm currently the president of the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists, which is the oldest chapter and founding chapter of the National Association of Black Journalists. We are nearly 50 years old, and history started here in Philadelphia there. So I'm proud of that. I'm, I'm the first openly... A uh, queer person, one of the youngest presidents they've ever had in their history, and so I'm proud to be representing um, that organization at this point in my career, in my life. Um, just graduated from grad school, went to USC Annenberg, and got my master's in communication management. Finished it at the end of 2020, um, and did it during the pandemic. Like it was a year and a half program. Started it in the fall of 2019, and then just finished it just um, recently. And, you know, I wanted that master's just to, you know, just one, because why not, right? But also because I really wanted to build my network on the West Coast because I have an East Coast re relationship. West Coast got my degrees from the top communication schools in the country, in the world. And also it was an opportunity to strengthen my skills for my business and my talent. So I really learned a lot of things about management and leadership. And I hope to apply some of that in, when I talk about those types of topics on this podcast. So that's some of my career stuff um, that I got going on. It's probably a bunch of other stuff, but you know, y'all keep up with me. Use Google. But my personal life. So I've talked a little bit about personal life, but I, I do want to talk about it. So I, you know, in my personal life, um, I think I'm a good friend. I think I'm a great friend. I think I, my best talent is that I'm a great friend. Um, I have a great squad of friends that I have uh, really been riding with for a long time. Uh, my best friend here, we've been friends for nearly, what, 13 years now? Mm -hmm. It's been a long time. See, he's my Gail King. Um, you know how Oprah, I don't, oh, career moment. So let me back this up. I'm gonna tie this in because I gotta tell the Oprah story. I just realized I'm gonna tell the Oprah story. Oh, no. So let me back this up a little bit. So he is like Gail to me. Like <laughs> Oprah says, you know, he's the friend that, she's the friend that everyone has. The father 
I didn't have the mother that she just goes off. It's a YouTube clip, y'all, and she's emotional. She cries like I would do anything for her. Anything. That's how I feel about him, Jamarcus. Uh, Jamarcus Henderson, who basically helped me set up this podcast today, because he is an aspiring artist. Um, he has great music. He has a great album out called Atonement, and you must listen to his music um, if you want to listen to me. If you don't listen to his, if you don't listen to his music, you cannot listen to me. Um, his music is on Apple, Spotify, Google, um, YouTube Music. It's everywhere. Um, some of the music from his, actually his latest album that he just dropped, the song Rodeo, that beat instrumental that y'all hear that's popping that opened up this podcast, that instrumental is instrumental to Rodeo. So if you actually want to hear lyrics to that song, then you need to go listen to it. His name is Jamarcus Henderson. It's not hard to find on the internet or in any of your stuff. So if you're on Spotify, you can listen to my podcast now and go hop on that. Or I, Apple, you can do all of it. Like, you are already on there. Might as well. Don't make an excuse. We ain't making no excuses now. No. But it's a great, it's great music. He has a bunch of music. And I've been a part of that, that, that creative experience with him and over the years. And it has so many memories. I mean, it's so fun. Like, the music is a soundtrack of our lives. It's the soundtrack of our experiences and his experiences and all the work in between. So I just live. I stand. I am a stand. I stand. Um, so Oprah, since we're talking about best friends. So Oprah is like, I stand for Oprah. I, I know people got things to say about her. And this. listen, when were your faves? Okay. Because I'm going to have this moment. I have to talk about this. Since I'm talking about friends and everything. Let me say about Oprah. People got a lot of stuff to say about Oprah. But I say, look at your face. Some of y'all are still jamming Chris Brown. Shut the fuck up about Oprah. Some of y'all are still out here defending Bill Cosby. Shut the fuck up about Oprah. Some of y'all are still out here like a lot of these other problematic artists and musicians. Like Ariana Grande, who's a white woman. But y'all keep trying to act like she's <coughs> Latinx or whatever. She's a white woman. Y'all shut the fuck up about Oprah. I had to take a sip on that. So let me tell you something. I like Oprah because Oprah is somebody whose journey we have seen. We have not seen a lot of these people's journeys. Some people's families in Florida with money that got them on Broadway and got them success and talent. Some people's parents come from money and they lived in Lake Olympia and only stopped. But all I'm going to say is that Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, okay? who is the original woman who had the one name, right? Like Elvis, Aretha, Diana, Oprah. And Oprah's name is cool because not many people was named Oprah before Oprah <coughs> was Oprah. But Oprah is somebody whose journey we have all seen. And one of the things I love about her is that she embodies a lot of the things that I, I dream of, I desire, right? Not the, I mean, you know, billionaire, I don't, I don't want all that, right? But the aspect of ownership, the aspect of, um, you know, owning your work, the aspect of knowing how to take an idea and expand it. There's a lot of great things about Oprah in, the, in, in some of her aspects of her creativity. There's a lot of things that people can critique and best believe everybody, no one's above approach. I get that. But I'm just talking about this woman who has done Something as a black woman who has been in industry that does not, still does not respect dark skinned women, women who are, you know, plus size, women who aren't married, women who don't have children, women who, everything that this industry says they don't want. Oprah represents that, and yet Oprah has been able to find ways to succeed in spite of it. And that is an inspiration. And I just, I love it. And I just love the fact that she continues to reinvent herself and, and keep making herself cool and dope. Even, you know, throughout the years that like you can be hot and the hottest person in your field at that age. Like, and it's not like, oh, sh old people go away or whatever. Like, no, everybody deserves to do what they want to do in their career. But, like, the fact that she's able to just take shots and shoot things. Like, she's like, I want to be an actress. And she gets an Oscar nomination and plays one of the most iconic characters in movie history in The Color Purple. 
Like, she's chilling and she was cool with the late Maya Angelou. Like, she was interviewing Obama before Obama was Obama. Like, she makes stars. Like, she is... I just love her a lot. So, my Oprah moment, and, and one of the best moments of my life, next to me, Arya Huffington, because I think of everything in a foreshadow. My, my Oprah moment was in 2019... Um, Life is so so interesting, and I don't even get a chance to talk about this a lot, but I was, I had been following, I, I, okay, so when I was going to the National Association of Black Journalist Conventions, NABJ conventions, and folks know it's like a big old black media cookout. When I was going to those conventions, um, OWN, which, you know, she was really a big stakeholder a couple years ago, own network or channel used to have a uh, screenings for the shows and one of the big shows was Greenleaf so I used to always meet Lynn Whitfield I used to take pictures with Lynn Whitfield every year she would come and preview the uh, Greenleaf episodes and some of the cast members there is a guy I will not name him but he's an angel that was from Philadelphia knew of my work and he does some level of security or talent management or something with their with their with their crew. He's a part of that team. He works for them and he's a you know, he does a lot of work with them. So he would always see me and we was always in contact and he saw me one time. He was like, you know, saying, Hey man, you're there. We just, you know, buddy buddied. And he hits me up last year. This it was early last year. And he says, Hey, there's this new show called David Makes Man that's coming out. And they're trying to get on is trying to get some people to um to check it out, let them know what they think about it. And I was like, cool, put me up. I want to hear it. Sure, I'll watch it, whatever. So they sent me the contact. I got connected with the publicist, um, a part of that team and, and that works closely with Oprah. And I watched the show. I got to watch the first four episodes. Fell in love with this show. If you have not seen David Makes Man, please watch it. It's on HBO Max. It is an incredible show. Rush, uh, Felicia Rashad is in it. A couple other great actors. It's a great show. So I watched it, loved it. Emailed them back and said, listen, this show is great. This is unique. This is bomb. Y'all got some really good, some really good stuff going here. Kept it simple. July, last summer, I get this email. It had to be at two o'clock at night. It was late, but I was asleep. I was half sleep, mid-sleep, it was six o'clock. And I get this email and it's talking about you're invited to a screening around the, you're invited to a round table discussion uh, for the screening of David Makes Man. I'm reading it and they're saying, you know, they're, they're, that these are the people that's going to be a part of this conversation. Michael B. Jordan, Terrell Alvin McCraney, who is an Oscar winning um, playwright, uh, screenwriter for Moonlight and also was nominated for Tony for Choir Boy. And he's, they said, and also Oprah Winfrey. And it's in L.A., and it's going to be in August and yada, yada, yada. So I'm sitting there looking like there's several motions going on my head. One, I'm like already being like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to like, I, I, do I got money to go to LA? Can I fly out there? Let me, let me check my account. Let me call somebody. Who I got to borrow some money from? Like, I didn't even know. Like, shit, when is this? I, uh, wait, hotel, hotel. How much is the hotel? I got to stay in my uncle's house, my great uncle's house. I got somebody that live in LA. I'm just racing my mind trying to figure out, like, is this possible? Is this really for me? Was this my email? Is this real? Is that really going to be Oprah? I had so many questions because the shit just was, like, too good to be true. But it was actually very true and very real. So I called this publicist, and I'm like, wait a minute. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Y'all send an email. Is this spam? He's like, no. It's going to be a ransom. I said, with who? With Oprah? Oprah who? Oprah Winfrey, how? <laughs> like, I'm just like, where? I'm trying to understand this. I need to comprehend this. This does not make sense. You're asking, why me? Why me? Why are you thinking of me? I had all kinds of thoughts. And so he's like, oh, you know, we're looking for media. We're looking for different media voices and, you know, diverse voices to talk about this show. And you seem to be interested in it. We'd love to have you come out. I said, and how do you want me to come out? How am I supposed to get down there? Still doing that, you know, what you're talking about, Willis. But really kind of in this bag. So he's like, oh, we're going to fly you out there. We'll, we'll put you at the uh, Roosevelt Hotel. The, the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel? Yes, right by Chinese Grumman Theater. Grumman Theater? So I'm just like saying, okay, Ernest, you need to calm down. Act like you're a professional. Act like you know what it is. Sure, I can make it that time. What time do you need me to be there? 
We'll fly you out. What time? What's the fight? I'll give, I'll check in with you, but I'll confirm. Child, I dropped my phone. That was the second time I screamed like I was in Little Miss Sunshine. Took me back seven years ago prior to when I met Ariana Huffington in 2012. Seven years later, I'm meeting Oprah Winfrey. So I get the flight, get booked, get to the Roosevelt Hotel. Y'all, the experience was magic. I have nothing negative to say about the entire experience. We first did the interview with Oprah. I sat next to her. I interviewed her I about the show. Terrell Ivan McCraney is there. And the one memory I, I'm going to remember, and this is what makes me remember her in so many different ways, was that when I sat next to her, the first thing she said was, she said, oh, you look nice. And she said she loved my shoes. I still kept those shoes. If I don't fit those shoes again, I'm going to still keep it. I remember the outfit I wore. I remember every detail. I remember the jeans I wore, the blazer I wore, the short I wore. I took pictures. I remember everything. I was looking like a bad bitch when I came to see Oprah. The, the Versace cologne. I think she said she liked hot smell too. I was wearing Versace Dylan Blue cologne. I still got that bottle right over there. I was a fan. She said to me, she said, oh yeah, I can't wait until we take a picture um, at the end. I said, oh my God. She going to make me not have to beg for it? Praise God. I was here for it. I was like, oh, she know what she's doing. She's a pro. Oprah's a pro, y'all. Oprah knew, knew. She saw through my, my tentacles. She knew that I was nervous. She knew that I was in my head like I came dressed to take a photo. I came dressed to take a photo. So she she plays, she plays on on that and i live i live so we take a photo and she gets up under me and she cuddles me and we take a photo we're taking a photo like besties and i'm just like oh bro you can't do this to me stop playing with me you don't understand like this is the only person i stand stand for like I, you know I, listen i like Meryl streep too if i met Meryl streep i'd be hyped too but mm -hmm. oprah is like a different beast and viola davis too but oprah is a different like a different complete like triumph and so we take our pictures, the interview's over, and then we do the uh, red carpet step, step and repeat release of the show. And she finally shows up again, and we go on the red carpet. I already had my interview, but I go up and she says to me, oh, hey, Ernest. She knows my that, that She called my name. That was my, I'm, I'm the Ernest. <laughs> I'm fanning out again, y'all. It was a lot. We go to the party. Ava DuVernay was there. Um, the, the a lot of actresses was there. Uh, Angelica Ross was there. Michael B. Jordan was there because he was the executive producer of the show. A lot of other great actors were there. So many familiar faces. So much money was in that room. It was expensive. They had VC or Yellow Label wine for those who don't know. Viv Cooket. We had that champagne. Viv Cooket. Cook mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. So they had that pouring as a champagne. Um, for the vet, they they were pouring it like free range. They had full shrimp. My country ass was like, they have shrimp, unlimited shrimp. I don't know how that, this is LA on a rooftop, y'all. We in West Hollywood, Beverly Hills. We live in large. I, I just had a moment where I was sitting there. I was with a good Judy that I love in this business. Her name is Taylor Crumpton, y'all. Um, they are also another great um, black queer uh, journalist, freelance out here killing it. And I was there with her. And I just remember taking a moment on that rooftop and just looking at my life saying, who in the fuck am I to be in this moment, in this space with someone I do idolize and look up to and that I did all this and I didn't have to play the whole position. And when you get flewed out by your idol, call me. When you get booked in a hotel by your idol, call me. I just, that to me was my moment. That, tw like 2019, like that was before I got on for, like that was my moment where I was just like, okay, I'm never going to have imposter syndrome or not try to have imposter syndrome. I'm not going to question my talent. I fucking matter. I can do this. That was my moment where I was like, I'm that, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody. And it wasn't that it was like Oprah validating me. It was just the fact that it was a goal. It was something I've always dreamed of and I was able to achieve it being my full, authentic, honest self. And so if there's anything people learn from the experience, bring your full self, be your full self, do it, make it happen. You can fucking do it. So that being said, to my personal life, again, sorry, I digressed. We might be digressing a lot on this podcast in the future. But 
in this journey to where I am, you know, I'm a great friend. I have a great support system. I got to shout out my friends on here, my, my main squad, Amanda, Jessica, of course, Jamarcus, King Jamarcus, King Sean Marcus <laughs> the second. Um, Sharon Cooks, who is phenomenal. Love her. Chef's kid. Sharon. <laughs> Lauren Footman, like my rock. Um, Manny Smith, Deanna Jenkins, Abel McDaniels, my college roommate, who also was my, my boyfriend's college roommate. <sighs> Just so many great people who <clears throat> I've been friends with over the years, who have, who've been great to me. Mentors like Benet Wilson, Sarah Glover, you know, my, shout out to my lawyer, Charles Gibbs, the man who does my taxes and keep me in check, Kamara Ellis. Get you a lawyer, get you a team, get you somebody, you know, y'all. Shout out to my, my whole team, my whole team. My whole team is great. Um, you know, you know, I mean, my goodness. You know, to Shay, I think of all these great people who, who have been encouraging me over the, uh, in recent and recently, and just been keeping me, you know, keeping me, you know, fulfilled. And all the organizations I'm a part of, I'm part of, on the board of the, the New Leaders Council, Philly. You know, shout out to Kellen. Um, I'm on the board of Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists, Philadelphia Community Access Media, Philly Camp. I'm on all these different boards, and you know, just being able to be a leader and, and be able to feel supported and, and have this encouragement. Um, it was great. Like, I got people like Nina and Samantha who are like always been great people in my life. Dr. Miss Trish, who was my college house dean, who is just probably going to listen to this and just enjoy it all and laugh at it all because she was like always there for me during my Lindsay Lohan era. Um, my, 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 my crotch wasn't ever slipping out in any of my clothes. Was it? No? Okay. But my ass sometimes fell out of my clothes. That for sure. Because I had the little tight ones. But anywho. Anyway. So the most important, like, I guess, person in my life and friend in my life, outside of my mom, who is awesome, and my brothers. Oh, my goodness. I have three younger brothers who were just so great. Destin, Caden, Kelby, Kelby, Kay. Well, in, in particular order, Destin, Kelby, and Caden from oldest to youngest brother. And, you know, of course, my mom's boyfriend, his name is Harold, also great guy, also was uh, played an interesting part in me coming out to my family because um, when I decided to come out, I came out Christmas Eve of 2012. So as you can see, these years are interesting years. Like 2012 was a very pivotal year in my life, as you can see. I had turned 21. It was a big moment in my 20s. Um, you know, I decided to come out Christmas Eve of 2012 to my family and he was dead my mom at the time. My mom, you know, had divorced from my stepdad and she started dating him and he's been in her life ever since. He's a great guy. And he clocked it. He clocked it. I mean, I think they all clocked. I think everybody was clocking I was gay. My best friend looking like child, they all knew. They did. <laughs> but it was my uh, it was my moment to say, confirm it. Confirm. Confirm. Confirmation still matter. Okay, you can't just be assuming. We just, you fuck up and assume somebody said, you know that didn't happen. People that looked at people and said, oh, that person, and then you fight. Then it did to people in my circle. Don't assume. Don't assume. So, anywho, I confirmed, but he had clocked it and was helpful in um, creating that opportunity for me to feel comfortable. After several drinks, I got liquid courage and I brought my mother in and said, listen, I have something to tell you. She said, what? She's got a word. I said, I'm gay. She said, okay. <laughs> Is that all? I was like, yes. So it was what it was. Read th three outs. I encourage y'all to read it. The story is hilarious, but it's real. So anyway, a year later, and this is where I get to this story. It's 2013. I'm in this space for my, my, my senior year. At this point, my bestie, Jamarcus, knows I am not dating again. I had had some interesting relationships, situationships. I was just tired of the trade. I'm not going to tell you what trade means today. Go look it up if you don't know. But I was tired of the boys. I was dating bad boys, roughnecks, boys who were playing games. They call them fuck boys. I think they call them. Yeah, I was just not, you know, I just was out and about. You know, I just was just, when it came to romance, I was, hmm. I knew how to get myself pleased. I just didn't know how to get myself, um, 
in love. So 2013, it's summer. It's NSO, which is New Student Orientation. And I'm a senior, so I have really no business going to that, really. But, you know, it was a free parties and stuff. So there were some girls I knew that were some sorority girls, that were some black sorority girls. They was throwing, like, a rent party situation. I said, let me just go and see what happens. I go there. I see this really cute guy. I'm like, oh, goodness. This is a freshman. He's cute, though. Who is this? And I see him at the party. And one of his friends who at the time, one of his friends at the time, saw me and was like, oh my God, that's Ernest Owens. Because I think they had heard about my Huffington Post stuff. I had built like a reputation on campus. I was already like, I was like the, I was known. I was like a very known, like I was very popular on campus, I think, right? Yeah, I was popular. Mm. I mean, I wasn't, I mean, let me be clear about popular. I was famous. I had some haters, but I was famous. People knew who I was on campus. So um, somebody, somebody like, I, you know, I, I was like, oh, who's your friend? And she's like, oh, his name is Barry. I said, oh, he is cute. I said, let me talk to him. So I went up to him. And I was like, so what college house do you stay in? Because I stayed at the Boys College House. I was uh, stayed there through a scholarship. Um, and I was like, where do you stay? He's like, I was stay at Hill House. So anybody you know Penn and Philly, they know this. I was like, oh, okay. So what are you doing after this? I was being fast, y'all. He was like going to bed. I said, oh, okay. But I was, I was tipsy i was also very flirty but i just i was i it was just i was a mess i was in some yeah. true religion daisy dukes and a pink tank you know those days i can't do that anymore but <laughs> i <laughs> so i end up you know you know see i see him again the deltas throw this annual water ice social with spades and they throw it at the boys college house inside of our like multi-purpose space. Remember that multi-purpose mm -hmm. space? A lot went down there, right? So I'm there and there's spades and stuff. And I see him. And this time I'm dressed professional in school. So the 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 booty short, you know, all that goes away. So I try to do this flex where I act like I didn't know him. Like, hi, how are you? What's your name? And he's looking at me like Barry. I said, Oh, it's nice to meet you, Barry. My name's Ernest. Cause I didn't I was like embarrassed the the first time I met him because I was like a little thirsty. And I was also just sweaty and just a mess. But I was like my, my name is uh, Ernest. Like, oh, yeah, I remember you. I was like, oh, okay. So then I was like awkward. Kind of like, oh, goodness, you don't think I'm going to mess. So then there was space. Like, do you play spades? He's like, yeah. So there was a spade tournament. So we played against the Bathia brothers. And if you don't know who the Bathia brothers are, iconic. Kanan, <laughs> Romania. Like, oh, I forget all of them. But they're like these, these brothers. They're all like cues and athletic and wrestlers. But we was playing against them. We got to ask this, well, but we could play spades. And I was like, oh, we could both play spades. So I gave him my number. And so, you know, I would text him, you know, just like random, like, you know, Facebook friends. You know, we it wasn't really much. Um, and, you know, he'd come over. I would throw my little parties, you know, because me and Jamarcus used to go to the club. We used to go to the club, but we would throw like these little pregame parties. But we also would invite people to come through just to hang out because like I had the pop in dorm room. And my roommate at the time was Abel, who is like one of my best friends, who is actually Barry's best man because they ended up becoming roommates. Um, so I, 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 you know, I, you know, I had this crush on him. He definitely knew from day one I had a crush on him. And so I think he had a crush on me too. He, he did, but I think it was like this, like distance, right? Because I'm a senior, he's a freshman. He's like, yo, you're like all popular. You probably like tell this to every boy you meet. You know, it was that kind of dynamic at first. And so my birthday comes up. And we go to Eye Candy. Before Eye Candy was a piece of shit that's no longer open. But at the time, it was like the Friday night club for people that was 18 and older. So we went to Eye Candy for my birthday. A group of my friends did. And we go, me and him dance. And I'm like, oh, I really like him. And I tell him verbally. Like, I tell him I like him. And he's like, oh, I know. I'm like, this dude. But <laughs> so he's like, I know. And I'm just like, so, um. What you doing tonight? He's like, oh, I, I got to leave. I'm going to see my mom. Because he's from Trenton. So his mother lives in Trenton, which is like literally like an hour train away or whatever from Philly. So I was like, oh, okay. Well, I'll text you. So he texts me. Now, my bestie, Jamarcus, was not there that night. But the next night we go to Chipotle. He hears about this man. It's so funny because Jamarcus and him never saw each other until years later. But they never had that intersection then at the moment when they met. So it's, it's funny how that, that story plays. I wonder what it would have been like if he would have met him um, in 2013. So 
you know, we go through this time where we're just like playing this phase where we're just talking, but nothing's ever walking. And so we get to December at the end of the year. And I'm like, you know, I was such a whiny little bratty little person. I'm not like that anymore at all. <laughs> but I was like, you know, look, I like you. You wasted my time. Yeah, I was just like, you know, are we going to go on a date? Are we gonna, I, like, that was my mindset kind of like with him. I was getting over it. I was getting so mad. And he just kind of looked at me like, dude, like, whatever. So I was just like, okay, well then, you that know, very very. don't come see me. It is very very. <laughs> don't come, you know, don't don't come talk to me then. Don't don't say anything to me. I was just very. I was just being. It was not who I how I really felt, but I just felt like I just was not trying to play games. I guess that's what I would say. So, <laughs> so winter break comes. He texts me. Like, why is he texting me? Oh, he's thinking of me. Maybe I should think of him. So we end up talking on the phone, long hours during winter break. We talk for hours and hours and hours about life. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, like we're really connected. Like I really like this guy. And he decides, I said, look, I'm coming back to campus a little earlier. Would you like to like meet up and hang out? And we do. And so then it becomes a thing where we're like, oh wow, we like actually are like dating. But we were still chill about it. My One of my best, best, best friends who's listening to this episode, I know she is. Her name is Amanda Parks. She'll be soon to be Dr. Parks. She's in a PhD program. Pray for her, y'all. I just, I don't know how people do PhD programs, but she's been doing it for several years, so she's getting close to the finish line. But she was, um, had a birthday party, and I brought him, and she clocked it. She was like, she like, who's this? Like, y'all dating? Like, hmm. And he kind of was like standoffish, but, you know, very much like comfortable. And... That night, we agreed that we were dating. I'll say that much. Several weeks passed. We're, you know, consistently dating. But it's not public. We're just, you know, just getting to know each other. And it was, you know, kind of cute. So then the day before Valentine's Day come, and I think capitalism is what drove me to ask the question of, you know, so what are we doing? Are, like, are we dating now? Like, are we a couple couple? Like, are we for real, for real? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, well, we should make it Facebook official. So we did. And all hell broke loose. Everybody was like, wow, they're together. What, what's going on? Yada, 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 yada. And we became official the day before Valentine's Day, 2014. February 13, 2014, we became a couple. And we've been together for nearly seven years. So over the years, you know, we've dated and continue to be a strong couple we support each other he also was a communications major he of course graduated in um 2014 um not 2014 he graduated 2017 2017 um he's in communications communications pro uh, professional so he's on the communication side of media i'm on the journalism side of course and we just you know really have been there for each other and just he's been you know like my ultimate friend and lover and has just really shown me a side of myself that I didn't think that I had. Um, he brought the best to me and, and has brought the best to me. Has really supported all of my wild ideas. And when I was going through my ups and downs in my career, early in my career, he was very pivotal in supporting and encouraging me to keep going and follow my dream in journalism, even when I started to have doubts early on because of the, the stuff I dealt with with the startups and with all of the, you know, just the in and odd jobs, he very much so was a listening, uh, a listening ear and a different type of person that, you know, it just was, it was just, it was just what I, what I've needed and what I love. And I love that he's doing his thing. He's doing his communications professional work, but also he's an, an impeccable bartender, has a bartender company called bartender berry uh which you know for people follow him on instagram at bartender underscore berry <laughs> but um he has that and he's doing great work with that and he's just he's just so fine and just sweet and just nice and honest bluntly but just a great man and, and a loving man and yeah and so the, the the coolest part of this love story is that christmas eve right 2019, which is seven years of when I came out on Christmas Eve in 2012, he 
you know, proposes to me in a, in most in Houston because what we would always do is that his mother's Muslim. And so we would do Thanksgiving in Trenton and then we would do Christmas with my family in Houston. So that was always like our pattern. And so we were going down to Houston. Um, you know, it was, it was Christmas Eve and my mom was like, we should do a, uh, you know, we should go out to eat. You know, I want to go to Grand Lux Cafe. I'm so, I'm so basic. We over there in Galleria area downtown where the fountains are, uh, Gerald Hines Fountain is where we stopped. She says, well, I made the reservation because I'm a reservation queen. We could talk about that another day. But I'm crazy about reservations. And I'm like, I need to make a reservation. Like, I need to make sure that, you know, this happens. Like, I need to make sure we go to dinner. Because it's Christmas Eve. I don't want to miss out. So we go, we make the reservation. But they say before we go, they say, oh, we got a little bit of spare time. Let's go to the Gerald Hines Water Fountain, which is this big, huge, man-made water fountain that's gorgeous. And at nighttime, when it's dark, it turns gold. And it's beautiful. And it's fabulous. And it's, it's all these things. And the last time I went to something like that was, was when I went to prom. And I went to prom with a woman who knew I was gay. She knew I was gay. But I went to prom with her. And we took pictures outside that water fountain. I remember that during prom. And I hadn't been there in, like, nearly 10 years. So I said, okay, let's go ahead and... Uh, Go to this, go to this fountain. Let's just be cool. So we go down there. You know, I'm thinking we're going to all take pictures and it's going to be a cute little time to take pictures. Well, while I am looking around with my cell phone, doing video of the fountain, I turn down. He's down on his knees with the ring. The ring that I'm actually having in my hand while I'm looking at it. Hey, look at it. Look at it glistening. Go. Seven, seven. I'll get to that in a minute. So... He gets on his dad's knee. He asks me, will he marry me? And he's just so, he's so tense. He's so like, oh goodness. He, it was, it was, it was a lot. A lot in a good way. But my mom takes the picture and it's the picture that's the screenshot next to, okay, so my opener is Oprah, but the cover is, 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 is the picture. And a lot of people have seen it. it. It was on the internet. People share it everywhere. But it's a beautiful silhouette of us, me standing, him on his knee proposing, and this beautiful golden background, a water fountain. And my mother takes this shot on an iPhone, um, takes it with her iPhone and um, sends me the picture. Because I'm team Android, so this was like a very transactional experience. Put the phone in my, put the, put the picture in my phone. So she sends the picture to me, um, and then I, you know, I upload it, and the internet goes wild. It, it breaks our little internet. And, um, you know, it was, he proposed to me, and I am a fiance, and I'm getting married, and I'm super excited. And we're getting married, and this is the first time I've ever said this out loud to people who are not in my wedding, because security will be in the place. But we're gonna have a fall wedding at Penn Museum. We're getting married at Penn Museum, which brings it all full circle. Penn Museum was the first museum I went to where I wore my leotard back in 2010. And now 10 years later, I'm going to be walking down the aisle at the same museum where 10 years ago I was wilding out as a freshman during NSO. Life comes full circle. I never thought that while I was twerking near the, the, the King Tut, you know, you know, a King Tut exhibit, I was going to be walking down the aisle. Like, you be careful. You're going to marry a fellow alum down here at this museum. I never would have thought that. So. Life is weird. Like, you just never know. Like, I tell people that, like, life is weird like that. Like, I never thought that was going to be my life. This was going to be my life and how it was going to play out and what it was going to do. But he, um, yeah, it's going to be at P Museum. It's going to be October 16th, which is symbolic because have y'all been paying attention? Pop quiz time. So, well, 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 part of the pop quiz. So his birthday is February 17th. And our anniversary as a couple is February 17th. So that's a four-day difference. My birthday's October 12th. Our future wedding anniversary is gonna be, I mean, my birthday's October 12th. Our future anniversary, wedding anniversary will be October 16th, which is a four-day difference, inverse. So that was what we did. So now when it's his birthday, so, so what we've been doing over the years has been I've had to go double time. I mean, sometimes I got to do the birthday. Then sometimes we got to switch out the anniversary. Now it's my birthday too. And you're going to have to switch out the anniversary. So we're going to have to do a duel. So we're going to, I love that it's, it's next to each other. So we won't ever forget each other's anniversaries. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be at Penn Museum. 
It's going to be about 100 people there. Invitations have already been sent out. So people that's like, oh, can I come? Can I get an invitation? Listen, I got a waiting list, but I'm telling you, those people who's on that waiting list know they're on the waiting list. We are at capacity. But it's going to be a beautiful fall wedding. I'm, I'm, I'm believing and having faith, right? I'm having faith that this pandemic will calm down, right? That means that I need y'all to wash your hands, wash your ass, wash your dishes, mind your business, cover your mouth, brush your teeth, wear a mask, social distance, and stay the fuck out of these bars and you public spaces, okay? Keep your hands to yourself. Keep your, your what they call them, aerosol particles to yourself. Keep it all to yourself. Masturbate. You don't have to hook up with everybody. Stop rolling in other people's bed and bringing your bed bugs to other beds and, and your COVID. Stay home. And if you go out, stay with a pod, a tribe, and, and keep yourself safe. Stop playing out here. COVID is killing lives. Over 200,000 Americans and black people have disproportionately been impacted by COVID-19. So that is my public service announcement. But anywho, I'm looking forward to the wedding. I'm super excited about the wedding. Um, it's going to be great. Jamarcus Henderson is my best man. My best lady is Amanda Parks. My wedding party includes, oh my goodness, Jessica Anderson, Lauren Footman, Sharon Cooks, my younger brothers. And it's going to be a great time. And then also I got Nina and Samantha who's going to be singing at the wedding. Um, Barry's wedding party has Abel and Deanna and, you know, um, Amber and, um, Katrina, and, and he has his whole wedding squad, too, and it's super exciting. Brooke is in there, his friend Brooke Edwards. They're all in there, and so it's going to be a lot of, it's a lot of pin people, a lot of people that we've grown up with and become friends with, and it's going to be a beautiful wedding. We have a great wedding uh, officiate, officiate um, who is going to be doing it, um, who's a queer black woman who, you know, has experience in the spiritual lanes to do these type of things. Um, her name is Michelle Fitzhugh Craig. So it's a, it's gonna be a great wedding. It's it's gonna be a fabulous wedding. Um, I'm super excited about it. And the wedding party, I don't know what they're planning for me. I I've, I've, I don't know what they're going to be planning. They're planning some devious things. Yes. <laughs> but like I don't know what they're gonna plan for me. But I'm super excited. And yeah, it's gonna be a fall wedding. It's gonna be great. I'm gonna turn thirty. You know, 2021. I'm turning thirty. Like thirty. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna be in my thirties. And so there's a lot to live and a lot to, to be excited about. And all of those elements is what what we're doing to create this show. Um, I'm creating it to the show. Earnestly speaking, will be about these personal experiences. But we're going to be talking about the news of the day. We're going to be talking about the issues that you all care about. We're going to get into all of the pop culture, the politics, the juicy gossip, the news. And really, you know, embed some of my personal life. But I really want to do this cool sneak peek episode so you all can get to know me and who the hell I am so that when I start talking about my experiences about being queer and this, that, and the third or being black or whatever, no one is looking like, well, what, what the hell that come from? Or who is it? What is it about? You are now up to date. That is who I am. This is who I am. I, I put it all together two hours. So y'all all in my business now. Like y'all know everything and I, I got a couple of secrets I'll, I'll explode on more episodes. But this is the show. This is the the welcome to Earnestly Speaking, okay? This is it. This is the show. That's it. That's the post. Earnestly Speaking is recorded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud. To stay up to date with the latest on the show, Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mr. Ernest Owens. Use the hashtag Ernestly Speaking to tell me what you thought about this episode and check out my website at ernestowens.com.